So um, I thought it was pretty you got a good note in here about uh, About the Marine Corps and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna read this I'm taking this stuff from your your journal that you have online, yeah. which is, is awesome read So here we go back to the journal <laughs> The Marine Corps began to shape me long before I ever, ever arrived at boot camp in Paris Island, South Carolina. Carolina. It started when I read the book Brotherhood of Heroes, the tale of the Battle of Peleliu in World War II. It was through the stories of the, of the Marines told in those pages that I was introduced to the courage, spirit, tenacity, altruism, and brotherhood that the Marines possess qualities that I would soon be ingrained with as well the basics of these qualities were taught to me and my fellow recruits in boot camp through rudimentary but effective means the proverbial stick it was through punishment that we were shown what it meant to possess the attributes of a marine punishment would come in a variety of modes based on the same con concept countless push-ups sit-ups sprinting carrying and of course screaming the drill instructors would use any excuse not that they needed one to inflict pain upon us not being loud enough looking in the wrong place imperfection in uniform dirty squad bay and not moving fast enough for their inspections to name a few the reality of the situation was that we were never loud enough always looking in the wrong place, never had perfect uniforms, the squad bay was always too dirty, and we were simply too slow. The idea wasn't simply to pointlessly inflict pain, but to teach lessons using the pain as the instructor. It was to force us to make ourselves better so the whole platoon as a whole would be better. The idea was to form a brotherhood through shared suffering and shared dependence. It was to teach us to keep fighting the pain so that the platoon as a whole could stop being punished. The point was that once we reached perfection, the requirements changed so that we were forced to constantly reach for it, thus forcing us to become better than we ever knew we could be. This is how the Marine Corps takes hunks of iron and turns them into jewel steel. That's why the Marine Corps doesn't need a lot of recruiting money. <laughs> but so true. And I liked, the, I liked what you pointed out, the shared dependence and how when you're going through boot camp scenarios and, and training scenarios that are really hard, you realize you're not going to be able to do this alone. And yeah. you're going to have to rely on these other guys who you may not, in the civilian world, you wouldn't have even been associated with. And now you're not only associated with them you depend on them for for your survival and to get through it and that's I think that's what makes uh, that's what makes that military experience and certainly the Marine Corps does an outstanding job of it of, of formulating that bond that is is unique to the military yeah that's what that's the thing that makes Marines what they are and, and brings out the best in people is when they're doing something not for their own self-interest, but for somebody else. And I would volunteer for the worst stuff so that I could prevent my buddies from having to do it, like walking through the Euphrates River, looking for whatever, trying to find weapons caches in Iraq, and then getting back at the end of the day just totally soaked and covered in trash water. <laughs> You know, and they'd come in and say, we're doing it again. Who wants to go? And I'd be like, yeah, I'll, I'll go again, you know. And that's I think that's why I really I uh, kind of enjoyed the combat engineer role too because I'm going out there protecting people, protecting my buddies, protecting other Marines, and taking the risk on me. And, I mean, that's what being a Marine is all about. Anybody else would have done it too. Yeah, and so you go your first deployment to Iraq, and um, what was that deployment like? Where'd you go? Uh, Habania. Over in uh, Hobby, and what? Yeah. So this is two thousand eight. So two thousand eight. So things are pretty mellow at two thousand eight. Yeah, uh, Iraq had kind of slowed down at that point. wasn't much going on. We had one tiny little 
incident where we were on a convoy and some guy on his roof fired maybe three AK rounds and then ran away. Mm-hmm. And it was still, you know, nothing. And that, but that was in like the first couple of weeks. So yeah. I was like, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. I didn't miss it. I didn't miss hey, it. What was your response to the three rounds from an AK-47? I, I continued sitting in the back of the seven ton. Did, uh, <laughs> did, did like an 18 year old uh, Lance Corporal unload with 700 rounds of 50 cal? Or, or No, not? it was a long convoy, so it was way up there. And I was like, oh, I got to get out. Like, I got to get up there. But it was it was over before. Did, it anyone, did anyone shoot? Did they shoot back? Did they return fire at him? No, I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, he like. He did one of those things yeah. where he raised over his hand yeah. and then left. And by the time anybody was able to figure out where he was, yeah. he was gone. <laughs> so that was, but that was in the first couple of weeks. So yeah. it was, you know, kind of off to yeah. a good start. And then, uh, no, nothing else happened really. So we, what were you guys doing during that deployment? I guess it was kind of the uh, the build portion okay. of uh, of the strategy at that point. You know, we were. We were helping the local population build up their cities. Build. We were helping to build uh, uh, Iraqi police stations. And but what I spent most of my time doing was when we we would go out and find buried weapons caches. So just these old stores of RPGs and stuff that the Al Qaeda used to be using. Right. But they just left there. And then so the local population would – or somebody would give us a tip. Right. And we would go out to this big field, and they'd say, yeah, supposedly somewhere in here there's a, a weapons cache. So we'd take out our metal detectors and sweep every square inch of that field or hill or wherever we were, tree tree line. And until we either start determine there was nothing – or we would find it and we'd dig it up and stack it and then EOD would come and blow it up. And were you attached to a, a like a combat engineer platoon for, or were you attached to an infantry platoon? Yeah, so the way it works for the what we call division side engineers, like combat engineer battalion, is one combat engineer platoon is attached to an infantry battalion and then you kind of break it down so one squad of that platoon goes with each company. Got it. And then one team goes with the platoon, so you kind of help that platoon out. Uh, you're just pretty much attached to them the entire time. So when you guys would be doing these clearances of like of let's say a big field, it would be a, a platoon, a, a Marine Corps platoon, and you would be doing all all the sweeping. Yeah, so it'd be a Marine Corps platoon or a squad. It would used to be a squad. Okay, so it set a little. So bit smaller a squad would uh, we'd go out on a squad patrol patrol out there. They would set up security on the area, and they would just wait. Yep. And then you'd be me and one other guy, and we would sweep. And sometimes we would have one of the infantry guys have a e tool, mm-hmm. and we'd like dig there, and you would dig, and nothing. Would happen and then would you, when you'd find caches, would you guys blow them in place, or would you recover it? I guess it would depend. We mm-hmm. would take pictures of what we found, so we could write the report when we got back. And. If it was out in the middle of nowhere, a lot of the times they would they would blow it in place. We have to wait for EOD. They wouldn't mm-hmm. let us do it. Um, that's that's actually really jacked up. Uh, it's so stupid. <laughs> that is so jacked because up. Because there was only them. one EOD unit for the yeah. like four EOD guys for the entire battalion. And, and not to mention that's the fun part. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, and I have I, I know how to. They used to back in like 2005. Combat engineers were doing all that all the time. Mm-hmm. You just lay it out. You put. You just sympathetically detonated with a stick of C4, uh, and that's all it is. You know what this is? It's because the war had slowed down. Yeah. That's what then, it is. Oh, when the it, war slows down, all of a sudden people start putting the rules and regulations, and uh, I, yeah, wait, no, we could have a to do that. And then, when yeah. it's that same thing, we had the heaviest. I'm, I'm sure when you guys were in Ramadi, you just had the standard flak vest. Yeah. We had this ridiculous turtle shell, front <laughs> sappies, back sappies, side sappies, Neck protector, groin protector, everything, butt protector. Like it was just the the vest itself was seventy pounds. Let me tell you something interesting about that. When we were in Ramadi, not everyone had that, <laughs> and everyone wanted it. And, yeah, okay. and they they did their best. I remember actually uh, the colonel of the brigade coming down and bringing side sappy plates down to combat outpost to hand them out to guys because everybody wanted them. They wanted the neck protectors, the shoulder protectors, the groin protectors. They wanted everything. Yeah. I mean, most, all, many guys just, hey, you, you know, especially you're sitting in a turret or 
yeah like load me up i want all that mm-hmm. the neck they wanted it all yeah because it was gnarly yeah and then go try and do a hit on a house with it <laughs> yeah no that that part's not fun <laughs> but uh but so it's probably that same thing where they're just coming up with all the safety rules and you have to have your helmet gloves eye protection on at all times when you're outside the wire so for whatever reason they mm-hmm. didn't let us blow it up so mm-hmm. we'd have to wait for eod to come out and then they would either blow it up there if it was out in the middle of nowhere but if it was in the city they would usually take it somewhere and and meanwhile the rest of the combat engineer battalion are out do helping with the building the structures building schools helping the infrastructure and stuff like that it would depend i mean yeah so whatever that platoon that they were attached to was doing they'd just be doing that and then every now and then if they needed all of us back to build up an iraqi police station they would call everybody in or everybody but a couple guys in and we'd all go out as a platoon to build that got it but i spent most of my time just doing the cash sweeping and going so, on patrols. So within the platoon are certain people designated as like minesweepers? Or does everyone get trained in no, that? No, everybody should be able to do it. Got it. Um, How come you kept getting the, because you volunteered for that. You said, hey, I'll go find the, yeah, the caches. Yeah, I mean, and my fire team was, or my squad was kind of, we didn't want to do the construction stuff because we thought it was boring. <laughs> I wasn't great at constru- I could swing a hammer, but you know, I wasn't like good at it. Um, and so we kind of tried to put ourselves in positions where we wouldn't have to go do that stuff. There you we go. tried to always be out with the pl- with the squads, with the platoons, as often as we could, so we could avoid the construction stuff. But then, yeah, that's what I wanted to be doing. Yeah, yeah, be out on patrol. Yeah, exactly. So that so then that deployment, you come home, and you had already graduated from college at this point, right? Yeah. And so you come home, and then what, what happens when you get home? So or what's your I plan get, when you get home? When I get home, well, so we were in Iraq, and my buddy uh, Ronnie and Daniel, we were all drinking, and we were like, that was not what we wanted. You know what? The good thing is when you're drinking, that's when you make your best <laughs> military decisions yeah. about what to do with your career. But yeah. We were sitting there going, that was not what we were hoping it would be. Um we wanted to do some fighting, do some killing. Um, so we were like, we got to figure out a way to go to Afghanistan. And so we started trying to look up, because we were in the reserve, so sometimes there's there's programs where you can be an augmentee, mm-hmm. an individual augmentee. Did you have a civilian job at this point? I didn't, because I just graduated college. So you just graduated college, yeah. then you go on deployment, then you yeah. come home, and now you're saying, all right, what do... How do I get back? Yeah. How do I how do I go fight? I had twenty five thousand bucks from deployment, so I bought a motorcycle. You know, yep, another great decision. <laughs> you know, that's good investment, good long term investment Never crash for the future. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I was look at, at I was looking for a job to tide me over, and tr- tr- trying everything I could to go to Afghanistan. But luckily, pretty shortly after we got back, we go to drill, and company says, "Send a volunteer platoon to Afghanistan." And boom, <laughs> right here. Because Af- Afghanistan was heating up at this yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. If you remember. But but we had still had to wait about eight or nine months before we went to the workup for that. So I just took a job putting out traffic counters. Like there's little tubes oh, that go yeah, across yeah. the road and you attach a little electronic box to it. So I just took a job doing that. To That's sort of like related to IEDs, isn't it? A little bit. A little bit. It's on the side of the road. <laughs> like you know? Crush wire. <laughs> crush wire on the road. <laughs> that and I just got in shape and partied. Now, did you did you do more drill once you're uh, getting ready to deploy? Uh, yeah. Well, uh, so when I say drill, I guess I should explain. That's the the deal f- uh, for reservists you go in it's like one weekend a one month. weekend a month right. so that's they, your drill that's called the drill yeah do they escalate that at all when you're gonna deploy yeah so they kind of they kind of cater the drills that you do based on what what you're gonna need upcoming mm-hmm. so i do recall we did a couple where we would do go a uh, go do a like an ied training mm-hmm. uh section and then we would since i had experience now we would just take whenever we were at a drill we would just start training the other the new guys that were going to be going with us on machine guns 
metal detectors and just tra- getting them trained up. But, yeah, and so a lot of the training was kind of on our own because you only get that one weekend a month and they mm-hmm. only have so much money and they have to train the whole company as opposed to just the platoon that's going. Right. So so then did they activate you? How far before deployment did they activate you so you can do some, like, legitimate real training? We – so we did. We actually managed to get a month at Camp Lejeune, at Courthouse Bay, which is the combat engineer uh, school. And so we did manage to get a, a month long school of, you know, just doing demolition uh, refreshment, uh, more IED stuff, patrol practice. You know, just doing all sorts of training like that. And then your workup is pretty much just however long it takes to do Mojave Viper with your battalion. Mm-hmm. And then maybe a month before that. Yeah. So, so maybe three months total before you're going on yeah, deployment. If you yeah. stack it three, all together, four, three four months. Got it. And were you uh, were the rest of the guys? So it's one platoon that's going. One platoon. One platoon. It wasn't even a full platoon. It was just three squads. Okay. So how many guys is that total? It was actually even short squads too. So it was. Uh, let me think. Each uh, there was a fire to nine, ten, eleven per squad. Yeah, so, so 30, like 35 guys, and like then that. three for the the brass of the platoon. So check. Then you go, you do your desert drill, mm-hmm. and everyone's unified. And then you do you leave before that, and then then you and then you go on deployment. Yeah, so they give you a little bit of uh, yeah, they give you a little bit of leave before you uh, have to go over. So it's like four or five days, so everybody flies home and then Got comes it. back. So now you show up in Afghanistan. And what's how's that different from Iraq when you get there? You know what? The first portion of it was not that different. Um, the terrain was a lot different. Mm-hmm. So, Where, in, so where'd you where'd you first go? So uh, in Afghanistan, we were we start. I was I deployed with three seven as an attachment, third battalion, seventh Marine Corps regiment, and we were in Delaram which I th- I'm pretty sure it was in Helmand province. It was mm-hmm. kind of right on the border, so I'm, I don't recall exactly. But And pretty much Kilo Company was the company that my squad was attached to, and they got sent out just in the middle of nowhere um, to a FOB. And then they had a patrol base that was even smaller, even, even further out, that I got sent to. I was a team leader. Mm-hmm. And so usually you would have one team in the one spot and one team in the other spot, but... Since we were kind of short on guys, it was pretty much I was the only engineer for that platoon. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, so we were in in Delaram, and so in Habania was urban. Everything was, mm-hmm. it was walking through a city. Everything was urban, but Afghanistan was just barren. And what when you got out to this forward base, what were you do? What were you guys doing out there? What was the what was the infantry platoon that you were attached to doing out there? Uh, patrolling. So it was kind of similar. That's why I say it wasn't a whole lot different from mm-hmm. Iraq because we were basically just interacting with the local populace, uh, finding out what they needed, providing security for that area. Like they had a bazaar that would come every weekend, mm-hmm. so we'd go out and provide security for that. And so I was still using my metal detector to clear danger areas. If we can't, There was a lot of wadis out there, mm-hmm. so we'd have to funnel through the wadi. So I checked that. Um how often were you were you finding IEDs in that I didn't first find, part? I didn't find a one out no. there. No, there was it was a pretty pacified area. I think we had one firefight that one of the squads got into, mm-hmm. and that's it. Um, so, so your first part of the deployment, and how long was that? How long was that part of the deployment? That was two and a half, three months, I think. So that's kind of like a little tune-up, right? And then we passed that area off to the Georgian Army, and that's when we moved to. Sangin to to take over from the Brits. And now Sangin's in like that's Helmand Province yeah. Central, right? I mean that's, yeah, that's 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 it. Yeah, that's Taliban Central down yeah. there. Uh yeah. And so. w- as soon as you get on the ground there, did you feel it when you got on the ground? We knew, yeah. I mean we <laughs> we kinda did a push into that area before we actually moved out there and we knew shit was getting real when we uh they just they're like pack up a pack and we got on the helicopter and they just flew us out and just dropped us off in the middle of absolutely nowhere and we just started walking 
You just leave your packs here and start walking that way and just just basically just taking territory from the Taliban. Now, did you, do you guys do a, a thorough turnover with the Brits? I wasn't a part of that, but not really. I mean, we, we pretty much came into Fob Inkerman and were there for a day, day and a half. And and the Brits were gone. No, no, we Oh, we you left. came in and then you, yeah. you pushed out. So and the we Brits were out. there when you were when you were there on the yeah, ground. Yeah, we were both there at the same time. The probably the headquarters elements were doing a turnover, but yeah. they were like, "Hey, we're getting our boys out." Yeah, in the we field. started pushing immediately and we had a couple Royal Marines with us and some British army with okay. us. I think they had a small or uh, maybe a tow that we didn't have. So like units that we we needed from them, they would send out with us and they were great. Um but I, from what I understood, they just didn't have the manpower to really do much. Were they the guys that were with you? Were they, were you were they giving you any turnover items? Like, hey, you need to look out for this. Hey, this is what's going on here. No, or were you I just, didn't receive any because I. You just, I didn't just see don't em. think they really went out much. So yeah. I don't not really sure how okay. much they really could have told us in, about what was outside of the patrol bases, and I never. I don't even remember. I think we may have talked to their combat engineers. We got some demo from them. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, can we have some deck cord? And they gave it to us, and that's about it. Yeah, and that's because they were just completely undermanned. Yeah, the, from what I understand. Yeah. I mean, I, obviously, I'm not a part of the uh, upper echelon out there and stuff, but I think that's the yeah. reason. They just they set up patrol bases, and they had the patrol bases, but they pretty much just sat there and got ambushed and got shot at every day and didn't, didn't do a whole lot of patrolling. So, so then you guys roll in, and the the... Like the broad strategy is you're going to start moving from patrol base. You're going to push out, take another compound, secure it, and then operate out of there for a while and then push push yeah, on? Pretty much just take the Taliban's territory um, by going out, clearing a compound. And that's what a major part of what I was doing on this push was clearing compounds just in case they were booby-trapped. And then, yeah, we take over that compound, sandbag it up, knock down some trees with some explosives, create those fields of fire. And then once that was set up, we start doing some patrols, security patrols, and then repeat. <laughs> and were you guys getting in contact with the Taliban yeah. more often? They were pretty much shooting at us most days, mortaring us most days, not very accurate. Um, but yeah, they were shooting at us at least. And we, when we would go out on patrols, they'd shoot at us. Um, but they're always shooting from way far mm -hmm. away and you know we'd shoot back but it wasn't like further on in the deployment when the corn when the corn grew uh, a lot taller I wasn't there for it because I had gotten hurt by them but uh, that was when they were like people were shooting at each other in the cornfield like five feet away mm -hmm. Dang. so so but but while you were there it was more distant really far distant contact yeah were, were you guys taking any casualties I think not not tons. I mean, obviously, every one is a major, major sacrifice. But uh, there was one sniper that got killed uh, on the initial push on Musa Kala before we even got to Sangin. And besides that, I don't remember. Oh, my buddy Ronnie got hit in the face with a piece of RPG. Um, he didn't go home. He just had to... Mm -hmm go get it taken care of so minor stuff like that but yeah that minor stuff only happens when stuff is going on though. yeah exactly so and by the way that little piece of shrapnel you know that thing can kill you just as easily yeah. as uh you know a full piece of shrapnel it went in his eye yeah exactly um but i would say so so you're you're like now every patrol that you guys are going out is like hey now how how often are you finding ieds at this point not tons. Um, I'm trying to think. And Every now and then, not very often. Yeah. I mean, because the I, I think the area that we were in initially was still pretty close to the main fob. Mm -hmm. And then as you went out, there would be um, just fields of them. And the way that we were getting out to the the patrol bases where we were using Miklicks. And so that was mitigating a lot of the searching that we would have had to do. Um, so in that initial area, we weren't finding mm -hmm. tons. Just yeah, every every now and then. And I, well, I don't know if this is right or not, but 
you know, the closer you get to a fob, you have security on the fob, you have guys that are looking out. So yeah. it's hard for someone to come in and, and dig out and put an ID exactly. in the ground. So yeah. you you got some level of security around the fobs most of the time. Yeah. Obviously there could be something there pre existing. And um day to day life are you guys are you guys on MREs are you guys getting chow or what's what's going on day to day life oh man I wish we had MRE so at some point during the uh, deployment we started on MREs mm-hmm. and I, you know I like MREs mm-hmm. I think they're good you're sick next <laughs> I, I used to like M- MREs when I was like 22, and then yeah, I OD'd on them. <laughs> Man, I didn't, I didn't mind them too much. But then when we started doing these pushes, we got these things called first strike rations, like the new MRE. Mm-hmm. But here's the problem with these first strike. They were awesome. When we first got them the first week, they were awesome. But the Marine Corps only decided it would be good to buy three different f- meals. <laughs> <laughs> and kind of at the same time, we had outrun our water supply. Oof. So we were just stopping off at wells. And guess what? Nobody had any kind of purifying stuff. Damn. Um, so we were just drinking well water. Oof. And obviously what you would expect to happen happened. Everybody was getting sick. Just, you know, diarrhea, vomiting. That's crazy. No purification tabs or anything. I, don't th- I guess they didn't expect us to need to use wells, but yeah. that first day, everybody ran out of water by the by the time the, we ended, and we're like, well, we just got to go get well water. Isn't that crazy? A purification pill is like, I'm talking at you, Echo, like it's a little tiny thing. Like yeah. you can carry them so easily, and they completely change the game because you can take that water out of the well or stream that's got whatever bacteria on it, mm. put that pill, put that thing in there, shake it up, you're good to go. Good. Does it taste different? No, not really. Not, not really. Dang. People use them camping. Yeah, this is iodine tablets. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. In there. And you can also bring a filter. Yeah. Like when I hike, I bring a filter, which like is a little a, pump. Like a Brita it's a little pump. No, it's not a Brita. You know those pitchy. Can... No, it's not that. <laughs> it's a little pump. Little pump. Yeah, yeah. So, and how long are you guys going out in the field for? Um, let's see. The first push to Musclaw was about two weeks, and so we just yeah walk for two weeks we walk to a compound stop for the day set security spend the night walk to the next one if they shoot at us fight back kill them whatever do whatever we got to do and then we just kept pushing out and pushing out and then eventually we got to a point in that first musicala push where uh, for whatever reason they just they just said all right now you're gonna walk back <laughs> So, <laughs> I think I think maybe our uh, I think maybe our battalion commander had actually he had been a little bit too aggressive mm-hmm. and had gone beyond his limits that his boss wanted him to do. Yeah. So we ended up having to give up territory we had just taken. Yeah. And yeah, so that one was two weeks. But then once we got to Sangin, it was pretty much spend a day doing the push, take the compounds. And then you're kind of in the compound. You just go out and patrol, and then you come back. So mm-hmm. we weren't really out in the field, field right, right. Uh, for all that long. But it, you know, being in a compound is still not exactly luxury. Yeah, you still don't have showers. Yeah, or... it's not the Kona Kai Resort. <laughs> Definitely not. 